The radical Democrats are trying to overturn the last election because they know that they cannot win the next election. Message to the faithful, President Trump brings his traveling show to Broward County and he draws cheers and jeers. Local party leaders on both sides are with us live. Dixie, uh, which has a derogatory meaning as it relates to African Americans. Old Dixie down, a mining day commissioner wants to rename a major South Florida roadway. We take that to the round table. Businesses should be hiring um, Americans, should be hiring legal immigrants, uh, but not hire illegally uh, cheap foreign labor. Trust but E-Verify, Governor DeSantis calls on lawmakers to require that every new hire in Florida be checked for legal status. Does that protect American workers and jobs or punish immigrants? We'll take that question to the roundtable. Good morning. Glad you could join us. I'm Michael Putney. I'm Glenna Milberg. With 2020 campaign season well underway, the president amped up the volume as he brought it home to South Florida this week. The rally at the Pack to the Rafters BB&T brought the president's political machine to Florida's most Democratic county. A huge crowd, 20,000 or so, packed the uh, BB&T Center for that MAGA rally in Sunrise, and he did not disappoint the faithful. It was an in-your-face gesture to Democrats and a sign of just how important Florida and its 29 electoral votes are to the Trump campaign. Democrats also rallied outside the BB&T Center in much smaller numbers, railing against a president they call unfit and corrupt, and they launched a big baby Trump balloon. Democrats vow to be Trump in Florida next year, but what is the path to victory in the Sunshine State? Let's ask some local party leaders. Cynthia Bush chairs the Broward Democratic Party. She is a longtime party activist. Richard DiNapoli is a state committeeman with the Republican Party of Broward. Great to have you both here with us this morning. Thank you for Thank coming you. in. Thank you. Thank Great you. to see you. Cynthia, let me begin with you. Here was, as we said, really a phenomenal turnout, 20,000 people or so in the bluest county in the state of Florida. I mean, there are, what, 600,000 Democrats registered to vote in Broward County. What is the message that is being sent here? Well, I think the message perhaps for the president, although I can't presume to know exactly what he was thinking, is that Florida is really important for his reelection campaign. Granted, and and yeah. there's a lot of Republicans registered in Broward, too. It's a very large county. Yeah, so. 260,000 Republicans registered in Broward. I think it's closer to 220, but yes. This was well, 252, uh, to be precise. Okay. Like, like we have numbers <laughs> people here. This was uh, billed, Richard, as a homecoming, the new newest Florida resident, Florida voter. Um, sort of provide context on why the president now moved here, became a neighbor to those 20 something thousand people at bb &T. Well, I mean, he's always had his wonderful, amazing uh, estate at Mar-a-Lago. He also, uh, you know, probably take advantage of the tax benefits for being a Florida resident. And it is a very vital and important swing state. And he had a tremendous rally uh, last Tuesday night. Actually, more people than went to the Elton John concert went to that rally, over 20,000 people. It was cheaper. It was probably, yeah, that's true, <laughs> that's true. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's just a vital swing state. Uh, like we talked about, 252,000 registered Republicans, one of the largest amount in the state, even though it also has the largest amount of Democrats. So just moving that needle a little bit, get an additional turnout of 10%, you're talking 25,000 votes, you're looking at a state of Florida where Governor Scott won the Senate race by 10,000. You can see the reason for coming to Broward County. Yeah, uh, Cynthia, um, in 2016, Donald Trump obviously won the state by one and a half percent, went roughly 113,000 votes. Um, what is the plan for Democrats, given this phenomenal turnout that we just saw, what is the game plan for Democrats to win Florida in 2020? Well, I mean, our work is really about expanding the electorate. Is We are out right now actually registering voters on a daily basis. Um, that proved, I think, critical for Barack Obama's election in 2012. And we've set a very high goal of registering 200,000 people in the state of Florida between now and the end of the primary. And um, 
in presidential elections. That is the way that you expand your base, particularly yeah. for the Democratic Party. Are mm -hmm. you doing this with paid workers? We have a combination, yes, of paid and volunteer. Um, the Broward Democratic Party has initiated a strategic plan back at the beginning of the year to recruit volunteers. And the Florida Democratic Party and the DNC have made investments in paid organizers to assist us with that. You know, let, let's delve into numbers and engagement because you're talking numbers. What we saw Tuesday night and what we see really in any of the president's rallies is numbers, sometimes bigger, sometimes smaller, but such passion and engagement. And mm -hmm. I will tell you, on, for anyone who's on Twitter, if you look on my Twitter feed, I, I put a little eight second video of Brad Parscale, the campaign manager, even before the president took the stage, throwing hats. And it is the most engaged, viewed, retweeted, comment <laughs> upon tweet in the history of my being on Twitter. And wow. to look mm -hmm. outside at the protest, uh, Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz had, you know, there's, there's passion there, but where were the numbers of Broward Democrats to equalize? They just weren't there that night. And you don't, uh, I don't think I'm saying anything that, doesn't, that anyone doesn't see. You don't see that kind of passion and engagement from Democrats locally. No, you really don't. I, I think it's, it, I think when you're having a, a rally where the president is coming to attend, and one where I think there is, was some nervousness on the part of certain people in our county to come. Um, we did get some pushback from certain voters. It, it, it could have the potential, obviously, to be confrontational. And I think that um, we've seen things on the news over in the past election when President Trump was running, you know, that there were moments when things were happening that people weren't comfortable with. So um, and so just the logistics of the location, too, is just, it is a yeah. very wide open yeah. location. I just want to put a, you, you're saying people were fearing for their safety. Is Perhaps that, is that some, what you're maybe, yes. And I also think the holiday week adds to the, the problem of it, a short timeline yeah. to get people there. Yeah. I'll give but you some stats that I, mm -hmm. that I saw from Brad Parscale. Uh, he said that there was 24% uh, of the people that showed up were actually registered Democrats at the rally inside. And 27 percent. What's the source of that? I mean, how would you possibly what know that? What they do is they have everybody register to get a ticket, and then they can research that by cross-referencing against voter data. And there's also a big push to register new voters in there. About only about eight percent of the people that show up they claim are unregistered, and then when they're waiting in yeah. the line, well, I'd we like have to teams see of that. I'd like to see that, that data myself. I, I certainly could believe a lot of NPAs, no party affiliation. Oh, yes. And in Broward County, the last figure I saw was 335,000 people, really the largest, fastest growing party in Broward County is not a party. It is people who are not affiliated with Republicans or Democrats. Another reason to come to Broward County for that very example, uh, Trump engaged a lot of NPA voters, people that had never come out of the woodwork to vote before. And that's something that when you come to Broward County, you're going to get a big swath of that voting block that you wouldn't necessarily get in some of the other parts of the state that are more red. Um, but you have a lot, just like you said, over 330,000, second only to Miami-Dade in NPA registered voters. Do you think there is a candidate on the Democratic side right now who could come to Broward and fill that bb and think. Yes, I think there are candidates that are drawing a lot of excitement. I think Elizabeth Warren in particular, I think, obviously has a very strong base. A lot of volunteers are already active for her campaign. Um, I've seen a lot of activity for Buttigieg. I think, obviously, Vice President Biden would always be a draw um, in a place like Florida. Yeah. He's always going to be a strong candidate here. But you need a <laughs> nominee to get those I, kinds of numbers. I think that's also the issue, is that we yeah. are still looking at our candidates and yeah. making our decision. Yeah, well, let me yeah. ask you about mm -hmm. the, sort of the, the most recent candidate making a big splash is Michael Bloomberg, former mayor of New York. He is spending three and a half million dollars in Florida. He is running, I think, a very, very professional, well done biographical ad. What do you think of Bloomberg's chances are in Florida? I think that I'm not really sure yet. I think that when you run a campaign that's purely on TV, it means you have to stay on TV <laughs> from now until the primary. 
I'm not sure that's sustainable. Mm -hmm. I think we've also seen that in Florida, in some of these big counties, particularly in a Democratic primary, if you have a ground game, you can do very well yeah. in a primary. I think Andrew Gillum showed that. He was not on television. He did not have money. I think it's not always about whether you have money or you're on TV. <laughs> To answer your mm -hmm. question about whether a Democrat could pull in those numbers, absolutely not. Otherwise, they'd probably be doing it. Um, I don't see any of the top tier of the Democratic uh, primary uh, candidates right now being able to pull in over 20,000 people at a stadium in Broward. Yeah, but that's not, again, anywhere. that's not going to happen, Richard, until there is a nominee of the party. But And who knows what will happen then. But, you know, I mean, who is the Democrat who you think you know, Trump should fear the most. Who could beat him? Who could beat him? I don't think any of them honestly can beat him right now. I really don't. I think they have a very weak field uh, across the board. They might have 17 candidates, but none of them really have what it takes. I mean, even President Obama said about Joe Biden that he just, whatever it was, he didn't seem to have it. And I don't see any of them pulling in the support, the traction that you saw Obama get in 08 or that you saw other candidates in the past you know, bring in and crystallize. Well, no, but let me, again, Not even I'm, Hillary. I'm, I'm, let me just say, February 3rd is the Iowa uh, caucuses. Not one vote has been cast yet. We're kind of, if I may say, and I apologize, we're getting ahead of ourselves by asking who could fill the BB&T Center. I mean, maybe by August of 2020, uh, after the convention, some Democrat will, but we don't know that yet. I think if you go back to Hillary's, uh, Hillary's uh, performances and attracting people during the 16 campaign, I don't think she ever filled anything of that magnitude compared to Trump in the general part of the election. Well, he is a huge entertainment factor. I mean, and Lena was there. Maybe after the break, she can talk about what it was like to be inside the BP and Tenors, uh, Center. Stay with us. We'll be right back. We are back with Cynthia Bush, Broward Democratic Party, Richard DiNapoli from Broward's Republican Party, talking all things Trump this week. Um, the president is going to be back on Saturday, making a big play for Florida and um, doing it early. Cynthia, is it an issue that none of the Democratic candidates are paying that much attention to Florida yet because of, for them, what comes before Florida's primary? I do think that's playing into some of what's going on. Obviously, Super Tuesday this year is bigger than ever. California is voting early. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a lot of the focus is going to be um, not on Florida for a very long time. Is that, that, that a problem? Well, I think, I think what I've always said to people is don't ever take Florida for granted. And we, we have some very big Democratic counties here. And if a candidate puts an investment in here, they may, it may pay off big for them. Yeah. Richard, uh, as Galena said, the president is going to be in Hollywood. He's going to speak to the uh, Israeli American Council. And uh, I've got to say at the bb and Center in the parking lot where I spent the day talking to Trump supporters uh, who were very nice to me. They hate the media, but individually <laughs> they're very nice people. Um, I saw a number of signs that said Jews for Trump. Now in 2016, 70 percent of Jewish voters voted for Hillary Clinton. Why are they going to change this time if they do? Well, it's, it's a number that has gone more and more Republican every election cycle. If you go back to the year 2000, that number was probably 80 percent. And it's been trending towards the Republicans ever since. So it's a voting block that is influential in the sense that you can, if you can turn some of those voters to vote Republican the next time, then that can be what makes a difference in a state that's very close like Florida. Well, I, can I say as the resident Jewish person at the table, I don't think you can count on Jewish vote as a block. I mean, Jewish voters, depending on background, are very different. And I think what you see a lot of the Republican leaning Jewish voters are because of a very strong Israeli support uh, over the past couple of years, moving the embassy mm -hmm. under President Trump to Jerusalem and declaring the settlements illegal. I mean, that is something that's, uh, that appeals to very conservative Jewish voters. Certainly not all Jewish mm -hmm. people are conservative as well. But I, I want to talk a little bit about um, 
numbers, Cynthia, actually, this one was for yeah. you. The voter registration, you talked a lot about the effort, the ground game to register voters. And Politico this morning has, um, has an article about Andrew Gillum, former gubernatorial candidate Andrew Gillum's now um, PAC, Political Action Committee, mm -hmm. funding a voter registration drive came out and said 100,000 new voters were added to the rolls, except the Division of Elections is disputing that and coming in with a far lower number. Talk a little bit, if, if you can, about what is the real number there of people being added to the rolls that are presumably going to be Democratic voters? I think it's, it's, complicated. it's a complicated process because we're always going through a process of people coming off the rolls at the same time mm -hmm. that they're coming on. Um, so I know from our perspective, every single month we're registering more and more Democratic voters. Uh, that is the way to, to get to the numbers that you're looking for. Um, I, don't, I have not had a chance to look specifically at the numbers that were referenced with comparing the, SD, the Division of Elections to what Andrew Gillum's campaign was saying. All I can speak to is what I'm seeing is that every single month, the Democratic Party is registering more and more voters as a group, and this is not something that we have done in previous presidential cycles, and that's just, that's very important. Yeah, oh. yeah Richard, let me ask you, uh, on the course of Tuesday, and I was there from early morning till early evening, um, I spoke to at least, I don't know, more than two dozen people who were there to attend the Trump rally. Uh, I had real good conversations with people, and when I got to the point where and they told me why they support President Trump, a good economy, uh, um, you know, strong support for Israel, all the reasons you would think. Mm -hmm. But when I said, well, he's going to be impeached, and are you worried about these? Well, you're shaking your head. Let me finish the question. <laughs> when, when, when I said um, these allegations that he abused his power by asking President Zelensky to investigate the Bidens, you know, and held up $400 million in military aid. Does that bother you? And to a person, they said, that's a hoax. It, it's, it you know, doesn't make any difference. Why would they say that? Why would you say it? Because the impeachment process is a sham. It's just a democratic uh, political, you know, effort to smear the president and to attack him in an election year. And that's what that's what they believe and that's what they're tired of seeing in the media and the democratic process the democratic party the way they're handling impeachment it's actually produced numbers that have gone down as far as people who uh, support the president those numbers have gone up impeachment has been going down in its popularity across the board uh, whether it's internal polling or for national polling like Emerson poll that recently came out and uh, a lot of people just don't believe what they're, what they're seeing. Well, that, uh, that sets up a week of impeachment hearings in judiciary, yeah. and it, um, it ends our discussion for time. Richard DiNapoli, thank you so much. Right. Cynthia Bush, Cynthia, great. appreciate you being thank here, you. and thank hopefully you. you'll keep in touch with us as uh, <laughs> 2020 continues. And up next, we're going to take all these topics and more to the roundtable. Stay with us. Well, we all celebrated Thanksgiving this week, a respite from the den of politics. Hope your Thanksgiving was basically free of politics. <laughs> but the den of politics anyway is all over the place. And right now we want to take a closer look. That's our Thanksgiving roundtable today. We have a great one for you, and it is supersized today. Sean Foreman is a professor of political science at Barry University. Mark LaPointe is a partner at Pillsbury Law Firm, former federal prosecutor and a Marine veteran of the Gulf War. Raquel Rocky Rodriguez is a veteran government relations attorney with McDonald Hopkins and was general counsel to former Governor Jeb Bush. Mark Caputo reports for Politico. He is covering the 2020 presidential race with a special emphasis on Florida. Hello, everybody. Hi, everybody. Oh, great Hello. big round table. No turkey, wine. no wine. <laughs> Sorry. What a shame. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, Mark, let me begin with you. Sort of the question I asked our previous guest, uh, and that is that Tuesday uh, in Sunrise was, to me, a vivid reminder and a good uh, needed one of just how deep and strong support for Donald Trump is here in South Florida, which is basically a blue area. Of course, these people came from Martin County and Brevard County and 
Naples and other places, but mainly it was South Florida. Well, Broward County is the second most populous county in the state, so it right. kind of stands to reason you have the, the second highest number of Republicans in the state anyway. Right. But an interesting thing for me is last week in Politico, we did a story about what is Michael Bloomberg, the billionaire now running for the Democratic nomination, uh, what is he thinking? How does he think that he could shape the race? And his advisors are telling us that if the election were held today, Donald Trump would be reelected because he'd carry all six important swing states. And Florida is number one in those. Yeah. So it's not just in South Florida where yeah. his base is strong. Bloomberg's own polling shows it in Florida, in Pennsylvania, in Ohio, in Wisconsin, in Arizona, in yeah. North Carolina. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, these are, these are important data points to think about where Richard DiNapoli, the chairman of the GOP in Broward, had talked about kind of the enthusiasm and the importance and how yeah. strong uh, Trump is in Florida. He's right. Yeah. Well, it, to your point, uh, Rocky, maybe that's why the president flew into Palm Beach. He lives now in Palm Beach County. Why not just hold it at the Javits Center there or some other big place, but not in Broward? Because people came from all over. We, we were there. Uh, to Michael's point, people were all over Florida. Why not hold this in Palm Beach County? I think that um, Broward is a very convenient location because you can, it's more, it's easier for people from Dade County and from the Naples area and the Fort Myers area to get into Broward instead of having to go a little bit more north and east uh, over to the Kravis Center. Uh, and so, uh, and I think that the, uh, the BB&T arena, I think is significantly bigger than the Kravis Center and uh, very well suited to the kind mm -hmm. of rally that he wanted to have. So I think geographically it was a great location. Yeah, Mark, um, I noticed out in that parking lot there were signs for every voter subset you could think of, gays for Trump, uh, Cubans for Trump, uh, and blacks for Trump. Uh, but that crowd at that rally overwhelmingly, not surprisingly, but overwhelmingly were white people uh, wh what's the message there? Well, I mean, I, I think the, the image speaks for itself. At the end of the day, I, I think Mark Caputo, we were talking about this earlier, when we looked at what was on the screen, what we saw, uh, in fact, it was a, not just predominantly, you would have to say 99.9%. Uh, and, uh, you know, my view of the world is, uh, while that may in fact uh, be important to Trump himself, but at the end of the day, I don't believe, and I'm no political expert, that his base by itself is going to actually uh, prevail. I think he's still going to have to re reach out to other folks. He's still going to have mm -hmm. to reach out to other folks who are not necessarily part of that 34, 35, 36 percent that's been steady for him. There's no question about that. That base, he's on it uh, since he became president. But, right. but, but, but people sort of assume that that base is ultimately what ultimately uh, got him to win. The fact of the matter, though, is there are some folks who are not part of that base who actually voted for Trump. And for sure. me, at least, the question is whether or not those people outside of that base, outside of that core white uh, you know, uh, base who are actually going to go again and vote for Trump next time around. You know what I think yeah. the message is, I'm sorry, do you want to go, because uh, I was going to ask you, <laughs> the, and take, take this if you will and run with it. The message that started bubbling up in 2018, the Republicans labeling Democrats socialist. And you saw it bubble up here in South Florida where there are people mm -hmm. who have immigrated from socialist countries who know what that feels like. But it sort of has spread nationally. And I, I'm, I'm watching it as we go to these rallies be a very effective tool, even though technically speaking, Democrats are not socialists. They're just not. That's not a political statement. It just is. Do you see that resonating? And then when you answer that, then talk about what I just cut you off and you wanted to say <laughs> before that. It is resonating. <laughs> what I was going to say is two takeaways I have from that Trump rally is one, he seems to be in pretty good health. There were concerns about his health mm -hmm. and mental state uh, the week before. But, you know, to be up there and give that one and a half hour mm -hmm. rousing stump speech that he does over and over and come out of it looking pretty healthy. And secondly, the Republican Party and the members of Congress are staunchly behind him. As we heard uh, the Broward chair say, what impeachment? You'd, you'd almost <laughs> think that they feel like they won already. The members of Congress behind him, they're all, they're ready for this fight. So they're already moving forward to think about November 2020. And uh, yes, that talking point of labeling yeah. Sanders and Warren as socialists, as, as misguided as may be. Well, well Sanders actually does call himself he, a, a Democrat. A Democrat. Yeah, I was going to say, he's labeled himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so that right. notwithstanding, but you heard, for instance, at the rally, you know, the president brought up socialism again. I mean, 
Joe Biden isn't a socialist, Kamala Harris isn't a socialist, Pete Buttigieg isn't a socialist, on and on and on. But, but that's a real, a real resonating topic. Uh, Rocky, <laughs> let me ask you, um, again, I asked a number of maybe two dozen people at that rally, uh, are you worried about impeachment and these charges that are the basis of it? Uh, and to a person, they said no. Why does not, with at least the Trump base, why isn't there any traction for this? Or is it strictly a partisan Republican, Democrat kind of thing? No, because um, I think it uh, it goes beyond just Republicans. I know there's a number of uh, Democrats, maybe not so hyper-partisan, and some independents that still haven't seen a reason to impeach the president, much less remove him from office. And uh, I, I really do think that the election is what matters. Let the people yeah. decide. Yeah. And from, for Republicans uh, to a person, uh, I think that nobody has seen anything, again, that supports a ground for impeachment. And they view this as a completely partisan and political process that is uh, more about the 2020 election than an actual uh, constitutional proceeding. What, what's the Politico view of that? Of which? the impeachment process possibly backfiring uh, it's possible uh, that that has been the conventional wisdom for some time but since the impeachment proceedings began support for impeachment went up and still outpaces uh, mm. opposition to impeachment <coughs> now it appears if you're looking at some of the polling and you're looking very granularly it is uh, you know that that rate of increase or support for impeachment is either stalled or fallen a bit but you know the conventional wisdom has been wrong about impeachment its, uh, its effects uh, uh, donald trump doesn't help himself in these circumstances by kind of lashing out. Uh, but we are gonna see a change after the House goes through its process and more than likely impeaches him. We're gonna have the Senate take it up and he's gonna be acquitted. So presumably if Trump messages properly, that should help him. Yeah, well then it will be decided at the ballot box in November of 2020, possibly. We're again getting ahead of ourselves, we're sorry. Uh, That's what we do. <laughs> stick around, we'll be more with the back to the round table in just a minute. We are back with the roundtable this week. Governor Ron DeSantis uh, made it a point to tell lawmakers and the general public one of his priorities. He is pushing for the use of E-Verify as, uh, as a law, E-Verify being the internet mechanism by which to vet workers who apply to make sure they are legal residents. Right now, uh, Mark LaPointe, right now is it's a law to do that to not hire undocumented workers um, in South Florida. Many are because of our economy here. The governor says he wants to make things safe and legal. Uh, people who are opposed to it say it is another way to, to harm undocumented immigrants. What say you? Well, I would, I would say when both the ACLU and Kidder Institute actually have come out against which we've just uh, learned from Rocky Rodriguez sure, during the commercial right, right. break. <laughs> but, but, but Cato has actually, they've yeah. published, they've published a position, uh, a position paper on E-Verify. And basically, <clears throat> the fact of the matter, though, is uh, everyone now is using E-Verify as this sort of a silver bullet that's going to solve all of our immigration problems. And, you know, that does not deal with the key part of this, and that is you want to have uh, comprehensive immigration that actually addresses, in a meaningful way, the number of uh, undocumented folks who are here, folks who are working with us, who are working in our homes, who are working uh, in our businesses. And, and frankly, the, the governor, <coughs> Governor DeSantis, lost me uh, as he was making the argument for you verify when he started talking about, uh, you know, those undocumented being, uh, you know, uh, breaking the law. He's talking about money laundering. Mm -hmm. To me, at that point, it showed a certain amount of bad faith. Uh, I mean, as a former prosecutor, as a former federal prosecutor, he's talking about money laundering. Somehow E-Verify is going to prevent those things. Uh, when I was prosecuting folks, uh, I got to tell you, you know, uh, undocumented aliens were not folks uh, that came under uh, my target. Those were not folks. They were regular they're Americans. They're not bringing in billions they're in They're not Washington. bringing in billions. They're not, they're not money launderers necessarily. I imagine there are some who are. But, but I would say that the numbers is no more than uh, yeah. perhaps the, the, the other folks. So, uh, so I'm a little bit concerned when the governor is actually mm -hmm. making those kinds of associations. It speaks volume to where his heart really is as opposed to solving this problem. Yeah, Sean Foreman, it was kind of a Trump-esque riff that the governor was in there when he, oh, who has generally been moderate on many of these issues. But, you know, as Mark said, I mean, to talk about uh, 
immigrants, people who are not subject to E-Verify being um, lawbreakers or money launderers. Uh, that seems to be sort of the governor following the Trump doctrine. Well, immigration was one of the issues that helped DeSantis win the nomination over Put uh, Putnam and win the governorship. Right. And they had a victory last year in, in Tallahassee for Republicans to say that they banned sanctuary cities in Florida, which, of course, we weren't sure that any actually existed, but that's now law. And I think the deal was last year, let's get the sanctuary cities bill passed, save you verify for next year. Right. Now they can come back, they have the votes, they'll get it through, and they can say they're tough on immigration each year. Yeah. But R Rocky, E-Verify is just a way to check what is already supposed to be checked anyway. I mean, if you just kind of, on face value, people aren't supposed to hire undocumented workers. They do here, and you know, it's just the law as it stands. So why, why is this so controversial? Well, I think uh, we have to separate, as, as you just did very uh, capably, the, the issue of lawful employment, of which you have to be authorized to work in this country, either as a citizen or resident, or have a visa, uh, versus the mechanism for verifying whether you are qualified, and that is the mechanism is E-Verify. Now, E-Verify is already in use in the federal government. If you're a federal contractor or you receive federal funds of some sort, and uh, it's already in use in state employment, and it's mandatory in a handful of states. And um, Florida, by uh, you know, no debate, that we do have a lot of undocumented immigrants working in the agriculture area and mm. in the hotel <laughs> area. And I think the thinking of the governor and the sponsors is, look, we have capable employees here whose wages are being suppressed because employers are hiring undocumented uh, workers who will work at a much lower wage. So part of this, I think, is um, I don't think it's in bad faith. I think it's in good faith to try to even the playing field for employers. Now, we do have to avoid unintended consequences. There are issues with the database. For example, they check your identity, but some employers don't check that the actual identi identification documents being presented by the person are actually them. Mm -hmm. They could use the ID, yeah. ID of somebody with a similar name, and the employers are not really taking that extra step. Yeah. And I think the bad faith is on the part of the employers that are not actually following the law. Yeah. Mark, you spent several years in Tallahassee covering the legislature and the governor. Um, uh, as Rocky said, there are big ag, ag interests, there are tourism people who really like the way the system works now. They're they don't, want government, they they don't, don't want, want government mandates. Either. They do That's not want right. government yeah. in their you know, office and making employment decisions. Yeah, but Donald Trump wants to win elections, so tough luck. Uh, understand, like, Donald Trump's election in Florida disproved the conventional wisdom that if you spoke so harshly about immigration, illegal immigration, you couldn't win the Hispanic vote, and therefore you couldn't win Florida. Right. Wrong. And then it was said, oh, okay, well, if Ron DeSantis does it, that's not going to happen. He got elected. Wrong. So <laughs> this should surprise no one. In, in the end, uh, you know, I, I'll let the, the folks who are, who are pushing or opposing the merits speak on, on their own, but... Uh, it, this doesn't sound like that significant a change to the overall way right. large employers operate. Smaller ones might have more of a problem. You know what? we uh, got to take a quick break, but we have a lot to talk about when we come back, including if you've ever driven Dixie Highway, there may be changes coming. Stay tuned. If you have ever driven on West Dixie Highway, South Dixie Highway, there is a move to change the name. And before we get into that discussion, take a listen to Miami-Dade Commissioner Dennis Moss, who made that proposal this week. The changing uh, the name Dixie, uh, which is associated with the Confederacy, slavery, um, well, I think KKK, mm -hmm. and... Um, you know, those kinds of negative um, movements that have been a part of our past. Dennis Moss says he is about to sponsor legislation. I don't know if you heard uh, Rebecca Sosa, another commissioner, said, wow, I didn't realize that. Sean Foreman, uh, the naming of, a uh, renaming of Dixie Highway, which goes clear across the county, uh, ha how do you say no to when you hear something like that? And yet, what problems that might cause business-wise for mm -hmm. so many people weigh in on that. It's not going to be a simple issue. Uh, when I moved to Florida from Western Pennsylvania in 1993, I was a little surprised by the Dixie Highway, you were? but <laughs> I was. And then I came to realize that that's part of the South. 
and there now we see there are Dixie highways uh, throughout not just Florida but other southern states that are part of an old highway system right so now we want to come forward to 2019 say let's change the name because of the recent debates over Confederate uh, symbols and statues and and words and um, yeah, you know, this is a big, <clears throat> big issue that I think we have to have a conversation about. I don't think a couple yeah. commissioners can come forward and say so. It's going to cost money for businesses, and it's going to be confusing for, for tourists. Yeah, uh, Mark LaPointe, a couple of years ago, we nationally had this debate, as Sean is referring to. Uh, Confederate statues were either taken down or moved elsewhere. I remember uh, uh, the mayor of New Orleans gave an eloquent speech when the a main statue of a Confederate uh, uh, general was taken down there. Uh, so it's a little surprising, isn't it, that this is only coming up now? But, you know, a statue is different from a historical highway name, whatever the connotations are. I think you're correct. If you actually, sort of in the hierarchy of things, when you think of the statue, the Confederate statues versus an actual sign that reflects a, a geographical sort of uh, location, there may be some distinction to be made there, but I would say, I would go back to Glenna's point. Glenna noticed that while Commissioner Moss was talking, another commissioner actually sure. stated, oh really? So to me there is a, there's a historical element here, and I think a, a lot of folks simply are not, uh, you know, unfortunately, not attuned to the, the deep history that we have in this country, that is deep history of, 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 of not just racism, that this was a country that was built upon slavery, that a lot of folks here uh, you know, have tremendous, tremendous pain actually having to actually uh, go through life, having to actually see these things, having to reconcile with it. Now, Sean mentioned it is part of the South, right? Mm -hmm. The notion that you have these things here, but that is the problem, right? If you ask an African American who actually, whose parents or grandparents, right, were, uh, were slaves, uh, for them that part of the South is deeply, deeply offensive. And for them, I think a community has responsibility in fact, uh, an obligation to actually address uh, the kind of scars, the kind of historical scars that people uh, are, are living under. So I think, I don't think it's enough to say, well, this may be inconvenient for folks in terms of what it may cost, or it is simply part of the South. Yeah. Uh, all of us have a responsibility to address this. I mean, let me put it to you this way. We live in South, in, in South Florida. Uh, could we have a street called uh, Fidel Castro Street running down, uh, <laughs> running down, uh, 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 you know, Coral Gables or some yeah. other place? Can, I don't can think I that just would take be accepted. that one because the the answer is not only no, but hell no. But <laughs> the Dixie is is there's uh, Dixie to me means Dixie cups. That's my first. No, I'm I'm being so serious. Mm -hmm. We had Dixie cups, little hygienic cups. There's Wind Dixie. There's so Dixie is so much else. Right. So, go ahead. I remember <laughs> in 2007, I think it was, when the legislature was debating changing the state song, which had some pretty racist yeah, lyrics in it, yeah. and a, a local NAACP organizer told me, what do you think I think of as a black man when I think of that song and I cross into Dixie, in, into Dixie County? Uh -huh. um, so, your experience, my experience, I think uh, white people's experience with Dixie is very different very than black different. people's. And that's a perfect example you yeah. pointed out there on that commission. Rocky yeah. Rodriguez, uh, Commissioner Moss had said, why don't we name this, these stretches of Dixie Highway uh, Harriet Tubman Highway or Road? And uh, with all deference to Miss Tubman, a phenomenal figure in American history, the Underground Railroad, you know, I was thinking, why not the Athlete Range Highway or the Father Theodore Gibson Highway. I mean, we have local heroes who fought for civil rights and, uh, you know, maybe acknowledge them. Yeah, I would agree with you. If we're going to rename a highway, we should look locally to see who are Floridians that we admire. Yeah, right. And I think it should be more than just the county commission deciding. I think uh, the citizens ought to have uh, a, mm -hmm. a say. And um, I, I think it's, you know, there's a lot of complexity to it. I'm not convinced that we have to rename it, although I absolutely recognize, you know, that there are uh, historical reasons and uh, very valid reasons in terms of not hurting our fellow citizens. But um, I, I think that this should require a lot more thought than just a quick commission vote. I hope uh, Commissioner Moss is listening, and maybe you just threw out a couple of names. <laughs> this could get a lot of fun. Thank you so much for a great roundtable. Thanks have for you being all here. here.
Up next, the effort to get open primaries on the 2020 ballot reached a threshold. If that happens, I can vote, you can vote. More <laughs> on that coming up. Stay tuned. Hey guys, looking like a warm forecast. 84 degrees for high temperatures today. You can see all the sunshine we have outside right now. It's not looking too bad at all. Sure, we have some clouds, but none of it is producing any rainfall. That's staying at 0%, at least for today. Check it out tomorrow. 30% chance of rain. I'm thinking this is going to be some morning into midday type of showers, and it's only at 30%. Drier as we get towards the afternoon at 83 degrees, so we are warming up nearing 84 at times. Look at this cool down, though. We're into the upper 40s and some inland spots by Tuesday morning. If you're near I-95, I'm thinking right around 51 degrees and we are going to struggle to warm up to that 70 in the afternoon. A nice cool stretch of 70s. Thanks, Brandon. This week, well more than 766,200 Florida voters made what could be the beginning of an historic shakeup in Florida elections. That is the number of petition signatures needed and now surpassed to get on next November's ballot. A question of whether to open state and federal primaries to all Florida voters, party affiliated or not. And that would allow me and Michael and maybe you, <laughs> if you are also registered independent, NPA, no party affiliation, to for the first time vote in a Florida primary to have a say that we've never had in the first round of choosing our candidates. So instead of just Republicans and Democrats voting for their own candidates, everyone would vote from one list of all candidates combined, major party, third party, no party, and the top two become the nominees for the general election. Take a look at the split among Florida voter registration. 37% are Democrats. That has actually dropped 17% in the last 20 years. 35% are Republicans. That's actually down 6%. 28% are no party affiliation. And that trend to be party free is growing. And so that's 3.7 million voters who have no voice in the first round of choosing candidates. Florida is one of a dozen or so states with a completely closed primary, and there are reasons and all benefit the two major political parties. Democrats and Republicans are unified in the fight to keep it that way. They ask, why should voters with no party loyalty have a say about its nominees? Fair enough. The parties run the primaries and they make the rules. But the parties don't pay for the process. We do. Taxpayers. We fund elections from the printing of the ballots to the counting of the votes and everything in between. For almost a third of Florida voters, that's taxation without representation. We pay. We don't get to play. Speaking of pay, petition gathering that moved the needle this week cost almost $7 million, funded largely by a Miami healthcare executive who became NPA at a frustration of growing extremism. In this time of bitter partisanship, open primaries would almost force candidates to acknowledge more centered, compromised uh, positions without having to worry about backlash from partisan extremes. It would also make the process more accessible to candidates who are not part of the party machines. Most of all, open primaries would give a rightful voice to some 3.7 million voters in a state where elections are decided by the slimmest of margins. That is our program today. Great to have you with us. You can catch any of our programs on local10.com. And remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. You can also subscribe to our This Week in South Florida podcast while you're there. Stay tuned right now for SoFlo Health. That's right here next. Have a beautiful Sunday.